Text from uh, the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter. Uh, listen to God's word as it comes from the Gospel writer and by God's spirit, a living word for us this day. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. And he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put into the deep water and, and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They began and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, break open this word indeed for us that we might be reminded anew of what it means to be those who follow you, we pray in your holy name. Amen. Some of you know that, that fishing is something I enjoy a great deal. I'll just tell the scouts, probably one of the very first three merit badges I got was a fishing merit badge. But in case you don't know that about me, here's, here's the background that's on my computer all the time. I love this shot from outside Aspen, Colorado on Castle Creek not just because of the amazing scenery or the fact that I'm 25 years younger there, but because it's one of the only fishing pictures I have where I actually have a fish on the line. So, so you shouldn't be surprised at all that, that, that I'm, I'm always thrilled when a fishing story from Scripture shows up in the lectionary texts that come. And this one doesn't show up all that often. But it's clear our, our gospel lesson is not about recreational fishing. It's, it's about men who do this for a living, not for a, a therapeutic hobby. Guys who spend late night, early morning hours in the water, not evening hours by the fire reading their Orvis catalog about fly rods. These are fishermen out all night, every night. The text tells us they're, they're cleaning their nets. And that little detail tells you and me the fishing has ended. And they fish at night to avoid the heat of the day, but also because their linen nets, pretty thick cord nets, are much less visible in the dark to the fish. When they're done, they spend a lot of the rest of the day taking care of their nets. Debris and silt get caught in the, in the flax fibers along with sticks and, and dead fish and, and trash. So nets need to be cleaned, mended, hung up to dry after every single fishing trip. So imagine having all of that work to do after you've been fishing along with the consternation of having fished all night and not catching anything. And and that's who it is that Jesus comes to. These seasoned, disappointed professionals, the, the carpenter, preacher who's using one of their boats as a pulpit, says to them, well, go back out in the deep water and, and, and drop your newly cleaned nets back in again. Simon Peter, the owner-operator of this little fishing group, uh, says, you know, look, Jesus, we... we we fished all night. And I'm thinking, he's probably saying to himself, look, we're the professionals. What in the world does a carpenter, what in the world does a preacher know about fishing? Yeah, I can, yeah, not much. But they do as Jesus instructs. They row further out into the deep water. They lower those newly cleaned nets. Lo and behold, a, 
a back-stressing, net-breaking, boat-sinking, haul, extravagant yield of fish. So many fish, they have to call the other guys on the shore to bring their boat to come back out and help. But I don't know if you caught, do you notice what, what happens next? Peter, Peter the fisherman, he's a professional fisherman, does not respond like I would think a fisherman would respond, like, like how did you know where the fish were? Or maybe even better, Jesus, could you come back tomorrow night? <laughs> just, just saying. Clearly for Simon Peter, as soon as the full nets are in and the abundance is realized, the catch, the catch becomes insignificant. The catch pales in comparison to the reality of the abundance producing power that confronts Simon in Jesus. And, and you can tell in the story, Simon shifts from the security of a, of a fixed, albeit failed reality, you know, fish all night, nothing to show for it, fixed, failed reality, to the overflowing, uncontained reality that is before him. I mean, just as the water is dark and deep, the, the gap Simon senses between his world and the world of this new creation Jesus is bringing is huge. Things have, have become pretty unpredictable, and my guess is a little scary. Simon now sees his situation as a lack of faith, not a lack of fish. Falls to his knees, blurts out, get away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Literally in the Greek, the get away is like, get out of the neighborhood. If you were here last week, you would have heard the preacher talk about, that, you know, that they, they, they ran Jesus out of Nazareth because of his preaching. Here we are a week later, they run him out of Galilee because of his fishing. But Simon's response is a classic biblical response to a revelatory experience. And I don't think that's just a classic biblical response. I think it's a human response. A sense of how small and inadequate the human spirit is before the magnificence of the Lord when it's revealed. And as John already alluded to, the, the lectionary, the other lectionary texts, the other texts for today deliver the same kind of message. The one he talked about, Isaiah 6, Old Testament prophet Isaiah saw the Lord sitting in the, on the throne. The hem of his robe fills the temple. The seraphs with six wings are flying around saying, holy, holy, holy. The foundations of the place are shaking. Places filled with smoke. And anybody who's heard this story in Sunday school over and over knows exactly what it was that Isaiah said. Woe is me. They're like, oh man, I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm lost. One of the other lectionary texts for today, 1 Corinthians 15, is about the New Testament apostle Paul, who's speaking about the Lord having all these appearances, and then he said, last of all, to one untimely born, the Lord appears to me, the least of all apostles, the one unfit, unfit to be an apostle. The cool thing in all of these stories, this, this sense of unworthiness on the part of each one is met with a word of reassurance. As John said, the seraph comes with a coal from the altar, touches the mouth, your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. Paul declares in that same breath, I am who I am, an apostle, only by the grace of God. Be not afraid, is what Jesus says to Simon. In other words, don't, don't worry. I, I know that this is terrifying. You feel, don't worry, I got this. It's, it's okay. And throughout Scripture, we could, we could read them over and over again. This is, this is what call stories are like. There's a divine revolution, a human sense of unworthiness and incapability, inability, and a reassurance from God that God has it in hand. I got this under control. But it doesn't stop there. And you already heard from John what Isaiah says. There's a commissioning and response that God says, who shall I send on? Here I am, send me. 
Saul, the persecutor, the one who was destroying Christians, becomes Paul, the apostle, who expands the church and the gospel. Peter, Simon Peter, Jesus says, and now, time to fish for people. And what's the text say? They brought their boats to shore, they left everything, and they followed. Call texts from Scripture are always an opportunity for us to, to be reminded about and given an opportunity to ponder our own, our own discipleship, what it means to be called by God and sent by God. And, and you may, like I often resonate with, with Simon or Isaiah or, or Paul in, in our ability to, to follow Christ and, and to serve. We may think, you may think, I may think our, our previous work and, and life experience may not fully prepare us for the challenges of discipleship, some of which we can't even see down the road ahead. We may think, I'm, I'm not equipped for that. Well, yeah, right. Sort of, sort of like, um, I had a whole class in seminary about how to stare at cameras and do virtual communion. <laughs> not. No preparation. But Jesus promises to work with us, to equip us, to enable you and me to do the fishing he calls us to do. So don't worry about your unworthiness, your ability. I'll take care of that. Last week there was an op-ed in the New York Times about live streaming. Tish Warren, an Anglican priest, in her article titled, Why Churches Should Drop Their Online Services, writes this. In March of 2020, my church was one of the first in our city to forego meeting in person and switch to an online format. And I encouraged other churches to do the same. And now I think it's time to drop the virtual option. People need physical touch and interaction. We need to connect with other human beings through our bodies, through the ordinary vulnerability of looking into their eyes, hearing their voice, sharing their space, the smells, their presence. Christians need to hear the babies crying in church. They need to taste the bread and the wine. I couldn't agree more with her. But there was one primary essential problem I had with the article, and that was the assumption behind it that all the churches went online because of the pandemic. And, and that was the case for a whole lot of congregations, those that, that got there, got there eventually. But it wasn't the case for Westminster. Three years before COVID ever showed up, this congregation perceived an opportunity, perhaps, if you will, a new way of fishing. Not, not to supplant the old way, but to add to it. To connect with people who couldn't get out. To, to meet people who, who lived at a distance. To provide worship for those who were recovering from some ailment at home or who were on the road traveling. Some of those people are out there right now, today. I agree, online church ain't like being in the room. The band just sounds different in the house than it does on the TV. But I believe and I'm convinced that streaming is just one more of the tools of discipleship God has given us. One more way to cast our nets. And, and there are people gathered today, some with a neighbor in their apartment or with their family in the den by the TV as well as here in the room. And they will all touch the bread and taste the wine. And they'll worship. See, the disciples' experience that day on the, on the shore of that, of that lake shows me that, that that for Jesus, it's, you know, ability is not nearly as important as availability. He, he promises to equip us with whatever it is we need in every new and different season to cast our nets to fish for others. 
In, in my study this week, I ran across a lot of things, but this is, this is the one quote that I really want to share to leave you with. It's just, it was just this lovely. To be fishers of people is to let, down, let the great net of your love down into their lives. I love that line. Trusting that, there will, that you will discover miracles and blessings and draw them out. To let the great net of your love down into their lives. That's, that's really at the heart of the gospel. I'm the real way you and I fish for others is to let the net of our love, which the only love we had is, is really the, the love we reflect from God, to let that nut into their lives. Whatever means it takes to, to get it there, to, to let our net of love for all people be put out into the world and into the lives of others. I guarantee you it's the best fishing you and I will ever experience. May it be so. Amen.